thing that we need to know about mortgages, the housing market, because we have our resident expert here on the Ward on Wealth who is here with us every Wednesday, and that is John Burroughs. He is a the the guru with anything mortgages. So, John, how you doing, man? I am good. Um, broadcasting under unique circumstances in that I'm uh, calling in remote from a completely empty office, almost empty, <laughs> Yeah. anticipating a move of uh, my headquarters in, well, about three minutes after we hang up the show at three o'clock today. So, And John is doing that show. because he is so devoted to this show and our listeners. <laughs> it's not that I'm going to drum on his head if he doesn't show up on Wednesdays, but I will drum on his head if he doesn't show up on Wednesdays. So. Mm -hmm. Well, I look forward to it every week. I, I mean, it. I've got all kinds of things on the agenda here. Fantastic. Some market updates. and well, You know what I want know. from you? Okay. We have been doing this, yeah. like, this multi-part series for, what, six months about selling your dad's house. And it was like, yeah, on the market, off the market, rates high, have a buyer, in escrow, out, just all these, the process, because we were going to walk people through and say, here's how to do it. Here's how to be patient. And the one thing that you kept saying is, it's always time to be in the market. It's always time to be looking to buy so that you can at least kind of keep your finger on the pulse. And then when it's time to strike, when it's time to bid, do your thing. And it's interesting because you've been through this. Okay, we listed dad's house. We got the realtor. We got you know these things mm -hmm. taken care of. And now I hear there is actually super good news. So tell us about that. Well, we um, closed the escrow on the transaction uh, this month here. A few days back, which I'm glad to say it didn't yield the kind of money that we would have liked to. But as is everything, timing is essential to the equation. And I have to say, I wasn't overly thrilled with the realtor's performance, but I wasn't the one that made the selection. So unfortunately, I didn't get the opportunity to go to what I thought was the best and the brightest to do the job. But bottom line, you know, no sour grapes. It got done. It closed escrow. and. And there you have it. But it was definitely um, an education and who those buyers are out there, because the only offers uh, that we got with a few looky loos that weren't really taken seriously were a lot of them were just all flippers. Now, mind you, you know, great house or a great location, good house, a wonderful neighborhood, good solid bones on the property. But Let's face it, if you don't update your home in the last 45 years, it's going to look just exactly as it is, an older, dated home that somebody's going to have to come in and essentially, I won't say gut it, but, you know, strip it clean. And uh, that's exactly who we ended up selling it to, somebody who's coming in to, you know, take the property and bring it up to market. So somebody got a good deal, um, but uh, it's a done deal. and I am for one, ecstatic about that. That's a chapter we can put behind us. I'm sure you can share your experiences from your clients when you're selling a family property after a parent passes mm -hmm. and what a relief it is to get all those final details buttoned up. And, you know, now it's just down to the distribution. That's true. So there yeah, you have it. It seems like it's forever. I mean, it just, things just, I don't know. It's interesting. I had a, um, I was with an attorney yesterday in court and it was on a, um, a trust administration court, uh, case that we're working on having to do with an accounting. And that's what I was talking about on yesterday's show. And um, we were talking about this very thing about, you know, selling the family home and, you know, pr providing an accounting and, you know, and, and, you know, being the responsible successor trustee that you're supposed to be and providing all the information to the beneficiaries. And I said, you know, it just seems like, you provide information to beneficiaries and it doesn't matter how what if you have a great relationship or a terrible relationship or just a regular old relationship with people it doesn't matter um his comment it says was you know the thing is it doesn't matter what you put in the accounting according to the beneficiaries it's wrong you know <laughs> it was it was kind of a funny comment and what what and he says yeah it's going to be wrong because the beneficiaries are going to look at it and go well I, 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 I thought you could have sold it for more or why, you know, this doesn't seem right to me. And I thought, I thought this was worth more money. And I thought dad's old couch was real leather. Wasn't it made out of real cow? And it just it was, we we're kind of laughing about that because we're actually 
I mean, he and I are on the opposite side of, of, of several different cases. <laughs> and we keep we keep becoming opposing attorneys to each other. So it's not that we're it's just a very funny comment. It's like it doesn't matter what you do with the trust administration, that the beneficiaries are going to believe that you've done something wrong and the accounting is not perfect. <clears throat> but I I can relate to you that the house is sold, checkbox, you know, now you can kind of you know, get ready to receive the money and put it in the trust and then figure out what to do with it. Right. Well, the money's been put into the trust account. We know that for a fact. So I guess uh, my next question is what's a reasonable time frame? Because there are a lot of moving parts, but the house being the biggest asset, you know, I would think that the, and we all know, you know, who was in charge and decided the sales price. So we can't really dispute that. And there's no dispute going on. It's just it is what it is. So I would assume you're looking um, <clears throat> at the final closing statement says this is the net proceeds. Here were the costs. Right. And this is the net proceeds. And you know, in our case, divide by three. And that should tell you, you know, what's going on there. Because anything associated with the sale was going to be part of that escrow. You know, the commission, the mm -hmm. fees, the realtor, all of that stuff. So. What else, as a beneficiary, should I be looking out for? We know there's other monies. That's going to take time, you know, uh, and I'm not concerned about that. But that one large asset, mm -hmm. tell me your, what you would advise. I'm your client, and I'm going, okay, where's my money? Right. Uh, at this point in time, what's reasonable in your perspective? The thing that has to happen to get the trustee's job done right, according to the terms of the trust and according to the California um, probate code, is that the trustee needs to account for all the money coming in and out of the at the trust estate from the date of death to the date of distribution. So there's going to be there's going to be an accounting, and I I I I always advise my clients to not do the distribution until the accounting is done. We've been caught off guard in you know several occasions where you know that it was like okay there's three kids they're all adults um here's what the house sold for you distribute it one third one third one third and then things kind of go on and Two on minutes, and on less. and coming to find out you don't have that you, you needed the money or you need it for something else or some tax has to be paid or something changed or we didn't know that that, that was an issue or here's a creditor and we ended up running out of money and now going to the beneficiaries and going you know we actually need to put some money back in the trust because we didn't realize there was these a, a higher administrative cost or the attorney's fees went high or there were taxes owed or whatever. So what I usually want my successor trustees to do is be completely done with the trust administration process, creditors One paid, minute. beneficiary designations, all that stuff is going to be resolved. And then we make the final distribution. So that's my Ooh. thing. That's my thing is if I were the successor trustee, I would hold that money and say, okay, here, here's the accounting. Is everybody good with the accounting? Because if you are, and we're ready to do the final, you know, closing of everything, then let's just pay out everything all at the same time in one check. Some benefit, you know, some people decide to do it differently, um, and that really depends on your relationship. And if there is other money, um, then all the beneficiaries, I would have a right, a written agreement that they all understand this is a preliminary distribution, not the final. That's what I would do. Gotcha. All right, you're listening to The Word on Wealth with John Burroughs and Gary Quackenbush. John Burroughs is a loan officer with his number is 760-944-6555, 760-944-6555. Coming back up, we're going to talk about Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and a loan originator You've perspective. got questions. We've got answers. This is The Word on Wealth with Gary Quackenbush of GQ Law. Gary's here to give you peace of mind with expert estate planning, trusted Oh, that was my fault. Sorry about that. No, we no, were no, that, on the phone. You no, know, you gave me the exact time and I knew I had to quit. And I just, I really uh, looked at the clock and went. I shorted you on the two minutes though, because we were.
long it's going to take. And we can get people out from under all kinds of tax problems so they can sleep again. That's our goal. Request your free initial consultation. GQLaw.com. 855-500-TRUST. GQLaw.com. Tell a friend about this broadcast outreach, The Word on Wealth, with Gary Quackenbush of GQ Law. Call or click to request your free initial consultation or to talk with a member of the team. Call Gary at 855-500-TRUST. GQLaw.com. Thanks for hot. All right. Welcome to the show. This is Gary Quackenbush. We got John Burroughs here. John is doing, he always does a fantastic job for us and helps us to figure out exactly what we should know about the mortgage market and the housing market. Yeah, John, I want to ask a, just an off the cuff question, unscripted. And that is if you were advising somebody now that was looking to buy a home, would you say, sit back and wait for rates to take a note, you know, to die? Would you say, get out of the market now? What would be your advice for a new home buyer right now? Well, I think it all comes down to the, the issue of need, uh, what is their real desire? I mean, if if it's a matter of having to have a roof over your head, having to find a property for sale, and uh, the good news is part of the notes I made to myself was to share that rates did take a little bit of a turn for the better uh, after they shot up and were in the sevens, the low sevens there for a while. We're back down to the mid sixes again. So historically speaking, this is not a bad thing. I got it. We can't stress enough that we've been spoiled for so many years, artificially, mind you, mm -hmm. with rates being manipulated. Um, you know, all that being said, you know, a six and a half percent interest rate that's is not fantastic. a bad thing. No, that's speaking, yeah. It, th in that, my career, so I'm, I'm looking at prices coming down, and you, know, I don't think you're looking at any more dramatic drops at this point in time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, all that being said, there's. Well, somebody got a deal on the house that we just closed escrow on. Now, mind you, it, you know, a year ago, the property was valued two hundred thousand dollars more than it actually closed escrow for. So, you know, all that being said, um, yeah, you know, it's it's there's still deals to be made out there. There are motivated sellers, and more importantly, if somebody is buying or selling at this time in the calendar year. Those folks are serious because who wants to be doing this during the holiday season? So if people are buying or selling, chances are they're very motivated and they're very sincere or serious about getting the job done. So I'd say if you're if you fall into that category and you need a place to live, by all means get out there, beat the bushes, because the realtors I interviewed this week says that that activity is picked up for them. They've got multiple buyers out looking for property. So people are jumping back in, no doubt. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I think that's good advice. And, uh, you know, you've seen the industry, you know, obviously much more, you know, detailed and hands-on than I have. I mean, I've just been kind of a, a spectator and, and part participant over my, you know, entire life here in San Diego. And it, you, you prices flatten out they go up and down but they never real they never dive they never just keep going it always it just always goes up and it just to me it makes sense if you're going to buy buy you know and if the market is really burning up and you can't you know you you know people are throwing buckets of cash on somebody's front lawn then you know slow down and kind of figure out what your budget is um is what would you give for advice on a first time home buyer as far as figuring out how much money they can really afford 
And the reason I'm asking that is let's say you have a first time home buyer and they're looking for a home and, and they, you know, somebody said, okay, you could comfort, you could comfortably manage a, um, an 800,000, well, uh, yeah, you could comfortably manage an $800,000 house if you put $200,000 down because you're going to have a $600,000 mortgage and here's what the rate would be and here's what your payment, you could comfortably handle that. So if that's the word that they're getting, you could comfortably handle that. Does that really mean that they probably could handle more? They just have to, you know, basically go out to dinner less or, you know, kind of, you know, a lot of times you say you're qualified for X amount of money. The lender, literally, if they say this is what you're pre-qualified for, that's it. They're not going to loan a penny more than that. How does that work? Well, that's always a moving target. And that came up today. That's a great question. It came up today in a training that I had on some of the new software we're implementing. And we were talking about that exact subject because oftentimes, and unfortunately, I see it where a realtor will get a pre-approval on a client and then invariably can't tell you how many times I've seen the realtor go out and you say, okay, this is their maximum. They have a little wiggle room, but not much. So keep them within this range because that's the borrower's comfort zone too Mm -hmm. on that monthly payment. So your question earlier about how do I advise them? Number one, education. And number two, knowing their budget. What can they realistically handle? What do they think they can handle? What can they realistically handle? And so I advise them all the time. And, And as a matter of fact, I'm going to have next week a great link as part of our new technology where if somebody's just looking for the education, we literally can send them a link to my website or to the app that we're using, and it will do a whole Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac approved first-time homebuyers education course that they can do self-paced online. costs absolutely nothing, and it'll ask questions you probably never thought about as the consumer. So Mm -hmm. my advice is education. Number two, is a solid handle on what your budget is. And then, of course, number three, the realtors, they hear 400000 on a or 800000 on a purchase price. So they're going to go out and sell them something for eight fifty. Huh. You know, and that's where you run into those, you know, those problems of those brick walls. So know your limitations and know your boundaries and keep them with regards to all parties there, too. Don't let anybody push you any farther than you are comfortable with. That makes sense to you. Absolutely. Yeah. And and I get that because I know we all are, you know, oh yeah, I can go a little higher than that. But yeah, once you, you know, if you're if you really like the house and you're being outbid and it now you're outside of what your budget could be and you're now, you know, three or four hundred dollars or five hundred dollars outside of your budget, that's where I think you got to really step back and go, Mm-mm, no, we're gonna get into trouble with this. And you got yeah, you gotta know where your own budget is. Very interesting. Um, two yeah, questions. Please, please I got two questions for you. One is your new the the loan application software so if somebody wants to get a hold of you um what they would be doing is you'd be letting them put in their information through your simple nexus tool right um so john's number you guys if you're looking to buy a home you're looking for financing john with the new company he's working for is um they have this fantastic way of putting stuff in you can do it on your own time it's all you know it's all computer based it's really smooth uh, call John 760-944-6555, 760-944-6555. The other thing you can do is email him. It's john.burrows, B-U-R-R-O-U-G-H-S, john.burrows at apmortgage.com, like applepawmortgage.com. Um, so then you contact him and say, hey, I'm, I want to get I want to get qualified for a loan. I really want to know how much house I can afford. What can I stretch into? then he's going to refer you and tell you how to get into that. Exactly. And it's fun. It's fun to do. Yeah. You get it done. Yeah. It's a little bit of work, but at least you have your numbers. Oh, very, very simple. And if people even have an issue, there's a chat or a helpline. If they are technology challenged, we've got that covered too. Somebody can you know, walk you through it, uh, hold hands. And, and it's not only just the application, the approval process, because you can you know, pull credit almost instantaneously but it allows then the borrower to follow the process from cradle to grave, meaning not just the application, not just the approval, but it leaves them an open line that they can chat with the loan officer, the loan officer assistant, and, you know, quietly monitor the process of their own file, uh, uploading their own information, their own documents. It generates needs lists where it says, hey, 
we realize that you are an employee of this company X amount of years, push this button, and we'll be able to access your bank accounts without you having to come up with the paperwork, and we can verify your employment in real time. I mean, the whole idea is to get this thing down to the process where you have same-day validation of all of the integral tools of the parts of the puzzle as a borrower. So the technology is fantastic. And I mean, to be able to, you know, I, I push a button and say, hey, you know, thank you for the W-2, but you sent me the wrong year. So I've assigned you as the borrower a new task. And all you have to do is, oh, okay, you can respond to it. My assistant and myself are instantaneously aware that you responded to it, you know, by text, email, whatever. And then you have the ability to go in there and upload the right piece of documentation. So you can say who's responsible for what, what time frame are we, and, you know, be able to monitor your own process in a, a greatly accelerated process. Awesome. I love that. So call John for that, 760 Five five five. That's John Burrows at mm-hmm. APMortgage.com. John, okay, a couple questions. Um, let's say so. First time home buyer, they're in there. They get pre qualified. Um, we've gone through the process. Now they know that they can afford a house. You know, with seven hundred fifty thousand dollars house because the amount of money they've got down. They go. They start to get into the bidding process, whatever. And lo and behold, the house price. The price gets up to. 800 850 can they can they how does it work like if if they then said wow i can do this but i need to find more cash and i know where it's available mom's got cash for me or i can get money from grandpa could you can you add cash anywhere along the way so that was one question number two is what do you have to do to add cash do you have to be you know have some documentation saying it's a it's a gift not a loan you know is that a good idea to have more cash available and say okay yeah we can increase that because we're just going to throw more cash in the down payment yeah that's actually really simple um we can uh, tweak loans all the way up to like you know right to the tail end of the transaction often and that's not that uncommon that somebody's short 20 25,000 bucks they just need that little push over the to the top or cover the closing costs. And don't forget, you can always ask the seller as part of your offer with the shifting market to pay some of your expenses for you. So that your cash not only goes for that, you know, goes for down payment, you get somebody else covering the closing costs. Two minutes to break. Adding cash is just simply going in and tweaking the loan processing uh, during the process. And if it is indeed a gift, um, we just we have a form, a simplified form that we just send over to grandpa or mom, dad, whomever. They just fill it out. That could be done online and even e-signed. I mean, it's just gotten that much easier. And we just have to paper trail the funds. Oftentimes, we just have them verified. They have the ability to give the funds, and oftentimes they wire it directly into escrow right at the close of escrow. And doing a wire transfer, we get it tracked. We know where it came from, where it went. So we don't have to jump through extra hoops of additional paperwork. So yeah, that's that's pretty common and pretty easy to do as well. Interesting. Now I've got I and this is at the risk. Well, there's no risk with you. So I want to ask a couple of questions. Let's say because you're getting to the market now where, you know, we're talking about rates being in the sixes and 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 we think it's kind of funny because I know One my first break. home I bought and and the six percent mortgage, it was six, six and a half percent, I think six and a half or seven. And we thought, oh my gosh, rates will never ever be lower than this in history. They'll never go lower. And then we had to get a a second to qualify, which was 30, a 30 amortized in 30, but it was due 30 due in seven. And that was up at like nine and a half or ten percent, I think it was. And we were absolutely thrilled. Plus, we put all the cash we could and we borrowed from family. It's like we had money all over the place to try to get into this house. But the prices were lower. I mean, that's a house that we paid, you know, 175 and sold it for 630. You know, so now we're talking higher numbers. So six percent on a much higher loan is different. So I got a couple of questions to ask John right after we take this break. This is the word on wealth of Gary Quackenbush and John Burroughs, loan officer and mortgage expert. We'll be right back. If you want help from me, call me at 855 500 Trust. We'll be back right after this quick news break. Clear. 
need to know everything. You just need to know where to find answers you can trust when you need them. Welcome to The Word on Wealth with Gary Quackenbush. We're here to help you build, protect, and transfer everything you've worked hard for with expert estate planning, trust administration, inheritance, and probate. Call Gary and the team at GQLaw.com. 855-500-TRUST. You're not alone. Ask for the legal help you need. Call Gary and the team at GQ Law, 855-500-TRUST. Or go Load Gary's free eBooks and videos. Read Gary's blogs. Call or click to request your free consultation or to talk with a member of the GQ team. That's GQLaw.com, 855-500-TRUST. All right, welcome back. We love having you here on the Word on Wealth. We ha- we're towing you along to the mortgage industry conversation that we have with John Burroughs every Wednesday. John is a loan officer. He's an expert. He's been doing this for over four decades. John's number is 760-944-6555. Why would you call John? Because he knows his stuff. He, he's been doing this for a long time. He's helped thousands of people. He knows the ins and outs of the market, how it changes. He's like a Mortgage nerd, in my opinion, and he knows everything he needs to. So, Mr. Mortgage Nerd, John. Gee, thanks. You're welcome. I guess well, I am. And I our mortgage it. geek, you know, it's good yeah. though. That's, you know, it's it's done you well. It's gotten you freedom and you're you're a good guy. Hey, so let me ask a, a couple of questions. Let's say, so you have a situation, because we're talking, I'm always talking about first-time home buyers because it's like my kids are kind of in that position. I got one that owns a home, actually owns a second home, and now- you know, other kids looking and you have a situation like the rates are, the rates are good. Now they dropped into the mid sixes, which is fantastic news. Thank you for sharing that. But then you get, you know, they're into this thing. They're trying to buy a home, you know, they're qualified for, you know, seven fifty. the bidding goes up to eight, the bidding goes up to eight fifty. They're looking for more money, you know, can, uh, you know, mom and dad kick in, you know, a, a 10,000 or, you know, whatever can grandpa throw, you know, 50 grand at this thing. But, and I know I'm talking big numbers, but homes are big numbers now. What a, what what happens with things like there's an arrangement between the kid between the home buying child and like a parent where the parent says, well, I, you know, I've got some money that I that I I, I was going to put it in the stock market, but I'd be happy to invest in your home with you, and I will. I will invest $50,000 on an agreement that when you sell the home, eventually I get my 50 back plus whatever, you know, whatever increase or whatever calculation you have. 
do lenders look disfavorably on that and say, no way that you, that's a, a secret loan or how to give me some insight on that. Yeah, that, that's actually an easy, it's a great question and an easy one to answer too, because there's a difference between a gift and then somebody being essentially the co-owner of the property. Now, the lender's not going to ask to see any kind of an agreement like that. But in fact, the scenario you just described does make the parent a co-owner on the property. And uh, I don't think it would be a bad idea that if they have such an agreement that they you know, might even share the title on the property so that the parents are assured that, you know, they are part of the process of whatever agreement they come up with, you know, on, on sale of the home, that they get reimbursed for that too. I will tell you, if it is being called a gift, they will sign a letter, not maybe, but they will sign a letter and say, this is a gift. It is not a loan. So you need to be straight up and honest about it as to how you're structuring this arrangement. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with a parent putting money into the property and being a co-owner on that property. You know, that's okay because they have a vested interest in the short and long term there too. So you have to think it through, but make sure that you're completely transparent with your lenders so something doesn't come back to bite you. Okay. And you certainly don't want to be committing fraud and say, hey, this is a gift, wink, wink, nod, nod, when in fact it really is not. Because the contrary you described is not a problem. It just needs to be done in such a way that it meets guidelines. And there's uh, always a way to be able to make things fit. Okay. So then okay. really, okay. no, and that that's exactly, I mean, that's perfect. I, I, I actually do, you know, these are something I'm thinking about. These are things that I have clients talking about because you have, yeah, I have clients that have money. I mean, they're, you know, you're 60, 70, 75, 80 years old. And it's like, I have money. I want to help my kids get into a home. I want to help my grandkids. And it's like, how do you do that? And, and, you know, a lot of people want to do the wink, wink, nod, nod. Oh, I'll, I'll loan you this money. I mean, I, I, I'm sorry. I'll, I would be happy to give you this money, you know, and sign the agreement. But then it's like, wait a minute, that's not even, that, that's, that's not true. So yeah. I like that, but this is something that we would, that would be something like we're talking to John Burroughs and saying, hey, John, this is an idea. You know, we need to get more money into their hands. What's a good way to do it? We're thinking of doing some type of an equity share. And then that's what you talk about. The lender knows about it. It's all in the calculation. That's money available. Is that something like if you're toward, you're, you know, in, instead of throwing cash into the escrow because now, you know, they need more cash. They want to get their payment down. They want to buy something down or whatever. Then that's where, okay, we won't put in cash, but we'll invest in the property with you. We will equity share with you. And then that's part of now, that's what's coming into this borrowing loan process down payment. Is that how that works? Right. Okay. Yep. Pretty much. It's not all as complicated as it sounds. I think honesty is always, you know, best policy there. Who was it? Uh, I don't know. Was it Abraham Lincoln said no man has a good enough memory to be a good liar? Yeah. Um, I think that was attributed to him, but you know, we just like to make sure it's all transparent, open and above board. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll figure that out. Hey, before I forget, yeah. um, I do have a couple of market updates, which were positive. So oh, please. I, want, I want to touch on those. Yeah. Um, just looking at a few things. Mr. Powell uh, talked to the public today, Jerome Powell, head of the Fed. He talked tough today, but what I saw as a positive, uh, he also softened on the next rate hike or heights which are coming up uh, potentially these meetings are the 13th and 14th of December. And that's where they fish, you know, set out the Fed policy and say, hey, if we're going to get a bump in rates, here's how much it is. Well, he softened up substantially today uh, based upon economic numbers and what they saw of that they may soften or lighten these next couple of rate increases, even down as much as a quarter of a percent, which was originally projected to be another three quarter of a point higher. I don't believe we're going to see that. I would not be surprised. So we're going to watch inflation figures and all the big economic indicators. Now, you've got a couple of biggies tomorrow. Um, the GDP, gross domestic product, came a little better than expected. Pending home sales were up just a tiny tick, nothing substantial. But the biggie on inflation is tomorrow. The biggest indicator that the Fed looks at, or one of the biggest ones, is the uh, personal consumption numbers. So that tomorrow is the announcement. And if that hints to 
a reduction in inflation, that's heading in the right direction. So we had two or three indicators all starting to tilt in the right direction to maybe get a little relief from this. So I'm very happy to say that that news that we're looking at um, uh, looks to be a little bit better than anticipated. So watch those numbers tomorrow. And that will be big news, and Wall Street will react one way or the other. So, and so, you know, and watch those bonds. That'll be the indicator. Okay. Okay. So that's the because we had you know bonds and because you were saying that that bonds you know we got kind of get mixed messages from all the major contributors. Their GDP came in better than expected. That's all good to know. Um, well, another thing you were, is you you had told me that you had an interview with a major bank employee about customer service and HELOCs. Tell us about that. Yeah, that was really enlightening. This was part of the program I had uh, talked about a few weeks back, um, an educational program for some uh, students up at um, Cal State San Marcos yeah. or California State University San Marcos, part of the business program. And I went through the last one of my student assignees, but this, I was very, very impressed with this highly intelligent, far more mature. I was talking to a 23-year-old who looked, acted, and behaved professionally and personally as somebody easily twice her age. So I was very impressed. And her goal, she really wanted to be uh, looking at doing the loan originations. Now, she works for a major bank right now and is not in the origination phase yet, but that is her aspiration. So I gave her some pointers. But in her current role, one of the jobs was, or one of her job descriptions is dealing with the customer service and doing the uh, intake interviews with them on equity lines of credit. So she gets that one product assigned to her and to be able to counsel and coach people, what are the uses for a home equity line of credit? Mm -hmm. what are they, how do they make sense? They're not giving tax advice. And I actually admit- Two minutes. Question about, well, what, what do you do when somebody's looking to get advice? What's tax deductible, what's not? And without hesitation, I was very impressed she said, look, that is not, that's out of my pay grade. We're not here to give tax advice. We strongly suggest that they don't have an economic advisor, they get one or a CPA. So they get the straight answer, they said, but some of those interest charges may be deductible, some may not. But talking to people intelligently about debt consolidation, mm -hmm. what does your average 23-year-old know about home ownership and debt consolidation and the nuances of home equity line of credit? And I will tell you, your average 23 year old is not going to be answer, able to answer either nine out of 10 questions with regards to that subject. And I was very pleased to say that it gave me some great hope mm -hmm. and real encouragement of how bright some of these young One minute. are focused and intent on doing things that are uh, health related, consumer related, and dealing with the general public at such a tender age and such. A mature and um, you know professional manner. That was blown away. It was a lot of fun. Oh, that's really cool. By the way, I do her an A across the board and recommended for her to be hired at the job. Oh, there you go. Well, I appreciate that. That's really cool. Um, John and I have got some more things to talk about. We're going to be going right to the top of the hour. If you want to be part of the show, call us at 888-344-1170 to call John and find out about this stuff directly from his mouth. 760-944-6555. And you all know you can go to my website, gqlaw.com to get free books, free tips, and contact me directly. Coming up next, private loans and rentals, agents being held account. We got all kinds of stuff coming up here on The Word on Wealth. You've got questions. We've got answers. This is The Word on Wealth with Gary Quackenbush of GQ Law. Gary's here to give you peace of mind with expert estate planning, trust administration, inheritance, and probate. Call Gary to build, protect, and transfer your wealth. 855-500-TRUST. GQLaw.com. Gary, our listeners are asking about trust disputes and whether or not they'll actually get the inheritance they're expecting. I think that's a scary thing for most people because they feel like, you know, if I ask my successor trustee, hey, 
where's my inheritance? You know, you kind of feel like, oh my gosh, I'm being like rude or whatever, inconsiderate. But I'm telling you, if time goes on, if it's been like 60 days, 90 days, you know, 120 days, that's too long to have heard nothing. You're supposed to hear fairly soon, like within a couple of months after someone's passed, you should be hearing from that successor trustee. And if you're not, I think there's an issue we need to address. So it's not like we're gonna go screaming in there and filing lawsuits. We kind of use gentle nudges like, hey, do you know what you're doing? Successor trustee, we kind of want to help you do your job and we help beneficiaries kind of get things straightened out. Call or click to request your free initial consultation. GQLaw.com, 855-500-TRUST, GQLaw.com. Tell a friend about this broadcast outreach, The Word on Wealth, with Gary Quackenbush of GQ. Your mic is hot. To request your free initial consultation or to talk with a member of the team, call Gary at 855-500-TRUST, gqlaw.com. All right, so good to have you along. This is Gary Quackenbush on The Word on Wealth, and we have with us John Burroughs, the one and only mortgage expert that I rely on to help us figure out everything we need to know about mortgages, home buying, et cetera, because John's, I like him because his attitude is get out there, hit the pavement. If you're going to buy a home, keep shopping, don't give up. It's going to happen. People have done it in the past. They'll do it in the future. The world is okay. This guy is not falling. Just keep at it. Keep at it. A um, couple of things that uh, John and I were talking about was that there are some indicators to show that that there are more debt settlements, you know, pretend there. So I want you to talk about that. The bank, you said bankruptcy and other credit indicators um, show an uptick in debt settlements and things like that. How do those affect our market? Yeah, well, and what I'm saying, I don't know so much about the real estate market, but uh, overall, but what I am seeing is that I'm more activity of those people that are coming out of those forbearance agreements. Uh, where they didn't weren't prudent enough, and unfortunately, if it was a job loss, things are related to that. I'd like to think we're over those hurdles now. Um, but all of that being said, if they weren't prudent enough to save the money that they weren't paying out in the way of their rent and or their mortgage payments, what did they do with that money? I mean, frivolously spend it, but mm -hmm. uh, those folks that weren't thinking ahead very much. Uh, or very well, for that matter, uh, are finding this, seeing some problems where now all of a sudden they're facing a bullet, so to speak, and with a balloon with a large amount of money they need to come up with and not being able to necessarily renegotiate, do a loan modification. I've talked to several debt settlement groups, um, one of which we've had on air with us, our Karen's Credit Corner of Inside oh, yeah. Financial, has talked about the increase in in uh, debt settlement that she's experiencing right now and of those people that are looking to modify their existing uh, <clears throat> home notes because they didn't plan ahead appropriately. So mm -hmm. we're starting to hear that. Other attorneys, bankruptcy attorneys, start to see a little bit of activity, uh, people mishandling their cash during those times, you know, those that we all experience, those upset through, what, two and a half years of pandemic right now? and. Mm -hmm. So all that being said, I advise to our listeners, the reason I bring that up is, and by no fault of their own, many people are having problems of this nature. <clears throat> Don't bury your head in the sand. Don't become the, you know, the consumer ostrich 
and uh, you just ignore the problems and hope that they'll go away because there are solutions out there, but you need to be proactive about it. So I'm just advising folks. Uh, most of our listeners are smarter than your average bear. We know that from experience, yep. but to be able to seek the proper help and, and also don't just go out there and deal with some fly by night organizations that's promising you the world. Um, you know, you see, a lot of tax companies that are monitoring public record where tax liens are. And of course, you know all about this. You're dealing with that issue. Right. Where they're going to get solicited by all kinds of uh, entities that are promising the world. And, you know, if it sounds too good to be true, we all know the answer to that yeah. probably is. But to work within the parameters of what's allowable, what's doable, to be able to get relief when it's possible and when it's appropriate and legal. I might add, mm -hmm. to be able to deal with these issues, folks. If you don't have those references, uh, you, Gary, and myself are good, good entities to discuss the issues at hand and find out what. And if it's something we can't help with, we certainly know people who can. Absolutely. So, and I think that's the, the the purpose of our show, too. And the reason that John and I are on the air is we talk about you know giving. You know, we are part of your team to resolve your situations, whether it's a mortgage situation, home buy, home sell. Um, you know, wills, trust, trust administration, being a successor trustee, being a beneficiary and getting your money. Uh, those are the type of things we deal with. Tax problem solving, that's another firm thing we do at GQ Law. If you need help from my firm and me, call us at 855-500-TRUST, T-R-U-S-T, 855-500-TRUST. Anything to do with home buying, mortgages, pre-qualifying, getting yourself set up. Do it now. I mean, don't wait and say, oh, wow, I'm going to start shopping for a home. I better go talk to John. Do it now. Get your, you just get things lined up. And then as things come up, you're kind of, it's a little surprising sometimes if you get into like, okay, we're going to be in the home buying mode now. Sometimes it comes very quickly. And all of a sudden you really get in the mood and you end up buying something. You want to get pre-qualified. You want to talk to John first, 760-944-6555. John, um, you have an example of a couple of things. And I always love this part where you you come up with like, hey, I, this is what I'm really doing. This is real life, real John's life. Um, your comment to me was that you, um, a private loan saving the rental unit, homeowners some money. What was that? Mm, oh, yes, absolutely. Um, I was brought um, to my attention through a uh, another estate planning attorney who was representing a client whose father had passed away. Um, mom had passed some years ago. The father passed away like one month before the Prop 19 deadline went into play, which was February 15th of 2021. Mm -hmm. Dad passed away like January 17th of 2021. Hmm. So there was quite a bit of real estate in the family. And unbeknownst to him, he didn't really under, understand or even know until his attorney pointed it out, looking, and they were very astute, uh, looking at the date of death and all that was involved, but there was a substantial amount of real estate. And one of them was a small apartment building, and not a single family and such. But back then, uh, because of the date, he was grandfathered in into the old Prop 13 uh, law, of being able to retain the parent to child exclusion because he met all the criteria under the grandfather clause mm -hmm. of what that was. When we did the math, initially, we found that um, he could save an estimated $1,300 $1, a month. I mean, that's not a small amount of change. That's huge. 1300 a month, $15,000, $16,000 a year in property taxes mm -hmm. just by doing the loan properly. So we were able to refer him to an outside entity, a private investor where they were able to give him, and it was such a small amount of money. Uh, they only had to borrow about $132,000 to the trust to make sure all the distribution was settled up like for like, and everything the fit appropriately into the right, right slot, and everybody's very happy. The one beneficiary is getting their distribution here by the end of this week, and this gentleman is ecstatic. It, it did not really cost them that much to be able to save Fifteen thousand six hundred dollars a year now and forever. So he's very very pleased, and the property's been held for a long time, mm -hmm. uh, and that is the only lien on the property. 
And the good news is they have the ability and in about 60 days, they'll pay that loan down to zero, have a free and clear property and not have a mortgage payment and be able to recoup all of those, the costs that they did to save that tax base in less than 12 months. I think it was about nine months and it was a break even. So $1,300 a month ahead forever. Wow. That's, so, that's, good news. that's, that's great. Yeah, that's good news. That's that's good timing. I mean, I hate to think that somebody cooperated with their death, but sometimes that happens. Sometimes that's great. That's great news. Um, you had an interview with the county assessor, who is a friend of yours and mine. Talk to you about that. Talk yeah, that, that was outstanding. Last week, we talked to Jordan Mark, who came on air for about a half an hour with us and talked about his role and what the election was like. And it was a little different interview in that I don't think we've ever talked to anybody who ran for public office and you know, won the election and what it was like to transition from the old job as consumer advocate in the attorney's role at the county assessor's office. And he gave some great insight of what the experience was like to run for office. And then he won by a pretty substantial margin. And I think he made our listeners feel pretty warm and fuzzy. Those Anybody who was a homeowner is going to become a homeowner knows you have somebody of that level of experience and concern for the consumer because he came from that job who, whose job it was to solve problems and run interference for the consumers. Well, now okay. he's running the show. And I believe all the people on his staff uh, share the enthusiasm I do for him being elected to the office. And we've interviewed him, what, a couple times a year now? And yeah. he, I think he, he did an outstanding job previously. Now he's the head honcho. That's so the cool. county two minutes really committed and he even talked about some of his plans for the future so it was really really fun i uh encourage people if they have any interest in something like that i believe there's podcasts out there and you can pull the show back up but it was an outstanding show and he is added to uh the delight of all of our listeners i firmly believe that that's really great now and that's the thing those are the kind of connections we have on this show um, Jordan Marks has been on the show with with John and I a couple of times. It's really good guy. It's fun to see. And you see political figures, people that are doing their thing. It's like, oh, are they real people? Jordan is. He's a real guy, a real person. Um, it's fun to have him on the air. He's very helpful. That's the thing about him. He's he's like innately helpful. He is um, good to people, good to his employees. Now he's going to be good to the whole his whole team. I mean, they're very concerned about like saving property taxes and his, you know, yeah, one of his platforms absolutely. was trying to preserve Prop 13 and to, you know, to try to figure out what can be done to kind of soften the blow of, of Prop 19. One minute. So we appreciate Jordan Marks. We'll have him back on the show. Oh, he's going to be busy. We'll get him back on the show eventually. But John had him on last Wednesday covering for me while I was out um, doing some things with the family. So I appreciate that. John is always available by phone, 760-944-6555. As he moves into his new digs in Mission Valley, we're going to keep in touch with John. He is here every Wednesday. Call him at 760-944-6555. His email is john.burrows at apmortgage.com. apmortgage.com. John Burrows at apmortgage.com. There's a dot between the John and the Burrows. Got that. Um, thanks, John, for being on the air with us today. I hope you have a great rest of your week. Talk to you next Wednesday. Thank you, John. All right, everybody, get a hold of me, guys. 855-500-TRUST. Talk to you tomorrow with Anthony Wright. Tell a friend about the word on wealth featured since 1995 with financial solutions attorney. Pass this hour in radio. Yeah. Has Noah or...